Welcome to Around the Horn in Wholesale Distribution with Kevin Brown and Tom Burton. Sponsored each week by Lead Smart Technologies, Tom, Kevin, and their guests review the news of the week and dive deep into the topics impacting manufacturers, wholesale distribution, independent sales agents, and the global wholesale supply chain. Whether it's M&A, SaaS and cloud computing, B2B e-commerce, or supply chain issues, we peel back the onion with our guests into the topics that impact your business the most. Tom Burton, Kevin Brown, we are uh, joining you every Friday morning to discuss the topics around the world, mostly in uh, the Americas here, about manufacturing, wholesale distribution, the economy, sales and marketing, mergers and acquisitions, technology, AI, and many, many different things. And what we do each week is uh, Tom and I get together. We've been doing it uh, today is 86. Yep. Uh, 86 times we've done this where we've gotten together with a community online and chatted about the topics going on as it relates to wholesale distribution and manufacturing. We publish a newsletter every week. It's called Around the Horn and Wholesale Distribution. We bring together lots of unique articles and interesting information, and we get together on Fridays and we talk about that newsletter. So if you don't get that newsletter and you'd like to, you can just reach out to us. It's very simple. Uh, you can reach out to us by email at hello at leadsmarttech.com. Or you can very simply go to the website for the podcast, which is www.aroundthehornpod.com. And we will you can sign up there and we'll get that out to each week. If you happen to be listening later on on, a, uh, on any of the popular podcast formats, Spotify, Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, whatever it might be, you won't be seeing that newsletter. But uh, in your mind, imagine you're seeing the screen that the rest of the audience is, is there looking at it. So we, again, do this each week. We're fortunate we uh, are able to do this on YouTube Live, LinkedIn Live, and Facebook Live. If you uh, love any of those um, uh, formats, just hit the subscribe, the, the, the follow or the share button, and uh, share this with your friends. Continue to follow us, and we would love to have you with us. If you got thoughts or comments, let us know as well. In fact, if you're joining us live today, chime in in the comments and let us know where you're from. Share your thoughts. Lastly, we couldn't do this each week if we didn't have the sponsorship from this company that Tom and I work for, which is Lead Smart Technologies. Lead Smart has developed a AI-enabled customer intelligence and CRM platform that connects to external data resources within your business like ERP and marketing automation and e-commerce products and so forth. We bring all that data together in one format, one platform, and we run AI models and tools against that to help make decisions that benefit your customer, benefit your teams, and benefit your business to accelerate growth. So if you would like any information about that, let us know as well. So, Tom, did I miss anything to get our housekeeping done? No, I think done? that's good. And, and you mentioned, you know, if you're online, oh, good, Paul, good, good to see you. Um, we've been having... Look, do you see what Paul said? He's at 35,000 35, feet. Okay. Uh, I hope you're in a plane. Or <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, yeah, let us know. Good. Hey, Scott, as well. Good. We've we've had some issues with the comments coming through. Yeah. And um, but hey, I, this is a new one. We're at the Mile High Club, I guess now, or the multiple Mile High Club here with Paul. So I don't want to put that Mile High Club thought together and my friend Paul Kennedy in the same. Yeah. Same okay. sense. I, think, okay. I think Paul's off to like uh, Eastern uh, Eastern Europe somewhere to start opening DSG branches because. They just opened another location this week and are growing, growing, growing. And it's on the phone with a couple of their people this week. What a great organization. So, Paul, we appreciate you being with us yeah. regularly. So, anyway, if you're definitely online, let us know you're here. We, Like I said, we've been having some trouble the last few weeks with comments coming through, but so far, so good. So, yeah, I, I'm sorry, Paul. That was a bad, bad, uh, bad analogy. Bad analogy. So, let's let's move on here. Let's get into the news. Good. It's nice to have Scott with us as well. In fact, Scott's... Uh, uh, California guy onto an Arizona guy and now Minneapolis guy. So Scott leads with us as well. And I'm sure we've got lots, lots more that are a little, a little timid to, to jump in here. So yeah, let's dive in. So each week in our newsletter, we uh, split that up into topics like uh, we start off with the economy and supply chain and we move in and talk about people and sales and marketing and technology and cybersecurity. But we'll start off with the economy and supply chain. So I have, Tom, I have informed Mrs. Brown, that we might be having uh, ground beef and ground turkey and, and beans for a bit 
coming into the next couple of months because I might owe you a steak. I think it's looking highly likely, yes. Highly <laughs> likely. I think you went it was the wine too. I think you said steak and wine, if I wasn't mistaken. But uh, I yes. Can, looking, I can, uh, I'll bring the wine in that case. I have so, better wine than Chuck's does anyways. But, uh, but yeah. yeah, it's um you know, I so and I, I was gonna I'm gonna make another prediction though. I'm oh, still no. definitely doubling down on my one one cut this year, but I think we're gonna see four cuts next year in 2025. So, so so unpack that a little bit. And the idea is the article that we first published today is about wholesale inflation heated up against last again last month. We were talking about uh, the PPI or the producer pricing index. So that's one of the key indexes the Fed looks at along with the consumer pricing index. This is tied to the producer price index is what does it cost to make stuff, right? So anyways, tie back. I just wanted to tie that back in. Right. And then the second article, obviously, is a CPI one, which is the right. consumer price index. Yep. So bottom line, it costs more to make things and it costs more to buy things mm -hmm. last, in, the, in the last yeah. month. Right. And, you know, I, I think I sent you an article, you know, now there's talks of potentially no cuts this year. I, I don't buy that. I think they're, you know, and you made a good point last week about there's just expectations that right. I think there is an expectation that something is going to happen this year. And I don't think that those, that expectation can be ignored. Um, but I do think I'm still definitely on the, on the one. What I do think, however, is that there's a number of variables and again, not to be pessimistic, but if I just look ahead into 2025, there's a lot of things that I think are going to potentially come together that could cause a bit of a slowdown and as a result of the economic slowdown, obviously, ideally, or, or we should see a reduction in inflation and, and prices as well. And I think we're going to see a faster pace of cuts next year. Um, yeah. One of those impacts, I really, I know people might call me crazy, but I actually think that with the AI maturity that I believe will happen predominantly in the second half of this year, we're going to see more layoffs and we're going to see more people out of work. And, you know, just things like that happening that um, I think you're going to, you know, will reduce the consumer spending and will just cause things to maybe ease a bit. So anyway, yeah. that's, you, you've now had my 18 month predictions on what's happening. That's good. I'm not ready to put any more any more bets out there yet. I will tell you this. And it's interesting, by the way, just a nice note from from uh, Terry. I think she's in Chicago land area and Darlene is uh, not far away as well here today. So the, um, I, I guess what, you triggered something on, for me last week in talking about maybe just one cut with uh, a half of, you know, 500 basis points uh, or a half a percentage cut versus quarter percentage cuts. Mm -hmm. And it, I hadn't thought of it at all that way before we were talking about last week when we had um, Lynn Chase on with us on the show. But you know what, what really really triggers for me as I think about that is, and by the way, I, you know, I heard some pundit yesterday say their thoughts were, you know, we're like more likely to get an increase than a reduction in any rates. And I, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. And it wasn't anybody that's tied to the Fed or anything like that. But I think you're still seeing a lot of that discussion if you, you know, MSNBC, you know, or CNBC, I should say, not MSNBC, but CNBC, uh, Bloomberg, some of the folks that they're talking to, are they're still talking about two, less people talking about three. But what's interesting is, and it hadn't, I hadn't thought about this at all until you brought it up last week, was that because um, you were talking about maybe a, instead of two smaller ones, we get one bigger one. I could see us actually getting two or maybe three of the quarter point ones so that there's the feel that the Fed is saying, hey, you know what? We're, we're not, we, we see what's coming. We're not doing big cuts, but feel good because we gave you two. It's, it's the same amount, but we gave yeah. you two, right? Again, we'll, we'll obviously see. I'm sticking with my one. I'm probably at this point sticking with my one and a quarter point, but I don't think a half a point is out of the realm of possibilities. So. Well, clearly the world of technology thought you were wrong because it just took your picture away for about 10 seconds there. Uh, so they just got tired of looking at me. All right. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So anyways, we see these, you know, then the reality of it is it just kind of goes back to this simmering up and down thing that we've been kind of talking about. Right. We'd rather see a rolling boil than a simmer. 
uh, with stuff that we're seeing. Well, and, and people are spending. I mean, there's no doubt about it, right? There is people are spending. They're spending money. They're continuing to put money on credit. Um, I mean, it's actually quite remarkable. And when you're spending, right, prices tend to go up. Well, so, I, I think for the most part that is, if we looked at the statistic, you're going to see that a big part of that spending is probably folks in the millennial range or lower uh, because they've never experienced in their life. You know, I mean, we remember, you know, lines to get gas right in the 70s and uh, and weird things happening in the economy. And we think about, you know, and, and, and I'm certainly, as I say every week, I'm far from an economist, but um, the um, as you look at kind of what's been going on here, you know, we're frustrated because of mortgage rates in the sevens, but in the eighties, we were 10, 12, 14% or more. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, in our parents days, you know, 10% mortgage rate would have been, you know, a luxury. Right. Mm -hmm. Because so, but I think what we're seeing is a lot of that exuberance, maybe, maybe exuberance is too strong of a word, but a lot of what you see going on out there from that high spending is from people who have never experienced a downturn before. Or of, of major, or when we what we saw 2008, 2009, in that time, they were too young to even really understand what was going on. Yeah, maybe, maybe. So, all right. Anyway, still well, sticking with my one. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm um, getting ready, looking forward to that state. Well, there's, there's no turning back for either of us at this point. So. Sure. That's right. You're, you're, you're hoping for maybe, one. Maybe we need to do the show live from Chuck's while we're eating the steaks That'd together. That would be pretty funny. So, so, hey, you know what? As we say that, uh, I'm going to throw this out to, but before we leave our our economy and supply chain section. I'm just going to throw that out to whether you're listening live or, or not is, you know, we're just, uh, where are we at? 14 weeks away from uh, the 100th episode and, and or the 100th show. We've got to do something, right? We can't. I've used you in a, you know, in a, in a condo and in, in me in my home office uh, for that milestone. And it's, it's astounding. I've got to come up with the statistics on how few podcasts actually make it that far. And I don't know if we're just, you know, crazy and keep going uh, uh, like others give up, but uh, getting to a hundred is a big, big deal that uh, I'm proud of you and what we've done with that. So we're going to have some level of celebration that, that ties into that. So we got to map that out and figure out, maybe we do it from the, from the beach in Laguna here and, and with umbrellas and boat drinks and, uh, and beach chairs or something. So I'll have to figure that out. Yeah, that, so should be, ideas, that should be a good audio visual experience. For yeah, everybody. right. Right. No, would, the cameras would only be pointing at the ocean at that <laughs> point. Uh, yeah, good point. The, um, but the reason I bring that up is if you got ideas, throw them out to us, let us know yeah. what we might might do for a hundredth episode might be fun. So before we jump ahead, uh, all right, Paul Kennedy says, take the show on the road. I think that was an invitation to do that from the uh, Dakota supply groups, corporate headquarters in, uh, in the twin Cities. So maybe we'll head, head I got somewhere. a lot of family in twin Cities, So that would be okay. I, I just want to go have dinner with Paul. Uh, okay. and some, get some That'd be good team. too. He's got some great folks on his team. We might, uh, I, I, I'm thinking there might be a, I've got a waterfront location in mind that could possibly work, but we'll figure it out. There's a lot of lakes in Minnesota. There is. That's a good point. Maybe we, you know, we've got a regular listener and a, and a longtime Lead Smart uh, customer that just bought a lodge in Montana, too. That's okay. an interesting thought. Okay. Right. Now we get the juices going. All right, everybody, keep that happening. All right. Very good. So uh, like Mike Franz just said, come on up. Mike's in Minnesota, too. So uh, that, that's uh, we'll have to keep figuring this. So but listen, we've been talking a lot uh, in the last getting back to the, 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 the reason that we're here and why people spend time with us is. Um, we've talked a lot about supply chain stuff and, and port issues, right? Last year we were talking about West Coast port problems and potential strikes. Then we had the Canadian issues earlier this year. We were talking about a potential East Coast and Gulf uh, Coast uh, or Gulf Coast uh, strike issues. But now we've got what we've been talking about with this kind of perfect storm, triple threat with Panama Canal issues. We've got issues with the Suez Canal, with the Houthi rebels and the bombings and, and uh, so forth that have been going on there. And now we've got this tragedy in Baltimore. So, you know, this is this resiliency thing. And I, I think it's, you know, we've talked about it regularly, but I think it's just really reinforces, you know, we've got lots of folks here running large organizations that listen in and, we had uh, Mike Mortensen from uh, 
ARG supply in Alaska on with us a while back. And we were talking about this. I don't know if you remember, but Mike was talking about, you know, never before have they had more conversations with their vendors about what their vendors supply chain looks like. Right. And understanding that because of the, this is a time where we've got to be, you know, plowing through and knowing really what's happening. They're, they're talking, you know, it could be just even the end of May that they could have a portion of the, the channel open in Baltimore. But right now they're only getting some small, you know, more like tugboats and some, a few barges through. And the, this article, you know, talked about the, um, uh, this was from supply chain uh, exchange magazine and or dot com. And they, they talk about um, uh, the capacity of the number of 20, 20 foot containers they can get through or TEUs, you know, 48,000 go through that um, just in January or a month. And there's hundreds of thousands, you know, of those going through some of the bigger ports. But it did have the same conversation, you know, that it's not having a major, that one thing is not having a major impact. When we start putting these things together, what starts to happen is we have supply chain issues. But the biggest thing that's going to come out of this probably when you added that third layer is cost, right? But but this article was, I, I think, looking at things from a little bit of a different stance is despite all of that, yep. right, is, you know, overall, we're being very resilient. We're finding workarounds. We're doing things. And, and I would bet, right, for sure, I completely agree that probably most distributors are definitely working with their manufacturers. And manufacturers are also very much digging into their different supply chain options. I think this has been... I think we're going to end up a lot bigger, better, and stronger as a result of all of this and looking at options and looking at things. And I think that's what this article talks a little bit about. Despite all the, the crap, we're, we're making it, you know, still making it go. Yeah. So they talked about, to your point, they, they made the quote, what has been done with work and resiliency has resulted in relatively stable supply chains in a short period of time. But what they also talked about, and they don't meant, they, they, meant, they don't mention the result in this article, they talk about what's happening though, right? Ships are going the longer route and they're going faster, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That adds huge cost. That does right? add cost, yes. Yes, it and does. So that's the big issue here is- in, in Back to the PPE or the producer price index that we were just talking yeah. about. Yep, exactly right. And so now we've got these added costs to get even finished goods and raw goods that are coming to North America and other parts of the world, right? And you know, it's if you think about something going from Asia to Europe to not go through the Suez Canal is it's devastating, right, from that time standpoint. So, you know, yeah, you're you're right that this talked about how we've been somewhat resilient so far. But that resiliency piece and I think what we're learning from all of this is we can't only be thinking about resiliency in our supply chain and resiliency is probably too simple of a word um, is that it, it's more of a have this be part of our, you know, I mean, sometimes people have a title of somebody within the organization or a group of people that's called supply chain analysts and things like that. Well, that's usually tied to managing numbers versus how we're getting things, right? And supply chain, you know, optimization and so forth is, is often tied to crunching the numbers about delivery rates and things like that. But I think this is going to become more and more important, more and more powerful to those wholesale distributors and manufacturers who are taking advantage of understanding this are going to be the ones that are thriving more because I don't think these things are going to go away. I think where the risk is, right? Can you imagine is if this, and I'm assuming the unions probably not uh, of the East Coast and, and uh, Gulf Coast uh, Port Workers Union probably is going to be smart enough to not go on their strike that's, I think, two or three months away while this issue is going on, uh, this tragedy in one of the ports that they impact. So hopefully that's the case. But imagine through all of this, if the port workers went on strike, as we talked about a month or so ago, was was the, the, our deal was being negotiated, could be a challenge. So anyways, let's jump ahead. Let's go into our manufacturing and distribution segment. Uh, there was a good article here about uh, manufacturing numbers as well. Um, and this did kind of a, a year, a year, a month compared to previous year month, you know, there's parts of it are down, but, um, 
they talked about how strong the first quarter of last year was, which would make it hard to kind of catch up with for this quarter this year as well, right? Yeah, so I mean, it looked like it was a big jump in the first month and then there was a decline to, from last year. So a bit of a roller coaster on, could just be some numbers, things that are there, but looks like overall just things inching up. Yeah, well, they talked about expanding to a level for the in the first quarter um, that that's higher and better than since the first quarter of 22. So, yeah. you know, I just think we're going to continue to see these kind of good new, bad news things, right? We talk about this each week kind of, but it's important that we're keeping on top and, and looking at these numbers and then understanding what they mean to, uh, to our business as we go ahead. So, um, but it's good. I think that's important to keep an eye on, on manufacturing technology, the PPI for production costs and so forth is, is powerful to do on an ongoing basis. Good. All right. Want to jump in on this uh, industrial metaverse, not just for large corporations. You want to jump on that first? Well, I think, I mean, overall, I was really, I was quite impressed with the article. I think it really um, kind of, you know, you hear a lot about the metaverse or augmented mm -hmm. reality or virtual reality. Right. You don't really hear a lot about the use cases that are behind it. And I thought they really did a nice job in here talking about, some of the use cases and I agree. I mean, I can't imagine any company large or small here in the next five years that would start to invest in, I mean, it'd almost be negligence, right? To start going and investing and building things and putting things together without doing some form of metaverse-y, like lack of a better word, metaverse-ish sort of right. testing or prototyping or all of those types of things. Um, I mean, it's just, you know, it's it's ridiculous, right, to think you would try and do that on a trial and error sort of situation. And I think that's their point here is that this is going to become the standard or this if this will be the norm. This is how manufacturing will be done, regardless of the size of the of the organization. Yeah. Well, and so it talks about right. And one of the quotes I liked out of the article was it says many people associate the concept of the metaverse with a colorful virtual world for entertainment and shopping. But it says its greatest potential lies in unlocking significant value for industry. And I think that's the case, right? So I think where most of our minds go in some of this would be, you know, back to, was it, was that Tom Cruise movie where it's in the room and pushing everything around on the, the virtual screen? Um, Minority Report, I think is what it was. Uh, or now we see, you know, Apple's uh, goggles, right, that they're out with and, and, and uh, Facebook slash Meta has their goggles out. And, you know, I think we've probably all seen the memes or the YouTube videos of people walking down the street with the goggles on and they're like playing drums or they're moving emails around or whatever it might be. There's so much more to this. Right. And so what we're talking about now, you know, is that idea of and I thought it was great. It's, you know, the the image that goes with the article, you can see it on the screen here. You know, someone is wearing some virtual reality goggles and they've got what looks like a Sawzall battery powered saws all in front of them where they're able to look at design prototypes and things like that. Right. So when we can now look at things and say, okay, let's look at not just a thinking from a manufacturing standpoint, you know, we're not just thinking about, okay, well, if we changed the saw blade to this, here's what we have statistically, but we can take that statistical data that we have, we can put that with the CAD drawings of what the new model would look like. We could take that saw blade and actually put it on four or five different vendors piece of virtual equipment and watch what it does. And, mm -hmm. and now we're getting this real world thing, not to say that I, you know, I do, you know, I'm just going to use a, 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 a sawzall or a reciprocating saw like they have looks like here in this article, but now I can test you know, Metabo, Makita, Milwaukee, all of the different, you know, Stanley Black and Decker, DeWalt, I could test my blades virtually with all of the data sets against all of those different pieces of equipment, and I don't even need to go buy one, mm -hmm. you know? So those are the types of things that we're going to see. And what came through my mind in looking at this, you know, they talked about it optimizing production, getting continuous feedback loops on what's going on with your production. We've talked a number of times about what the metaverse can do for us with training models and so forth that we can build for for our our teams and say well what does my business look like if i opened a branch here with this many counter people 
based upon this customer base and this end user base, right? And now we start virtually seeing the, not just the data flowing, but even what does that look and feel like, right? Do we have enough space to do these things? One of the things that you know came to my mind is if you know if you're thinking about if you're a manufacturer, you know, and you figured out how to optimally using the metaverse, right, to to build some tools where you're optimizing your warehouse for your pallets, your cases, however you're storing things, what great data you could share with your distributor partners. It says, hey, you know what? The best way to store this for optimization in your cubes or loading or unloading or packaging or whatever it is, is this. We've already done that work and they did all the model testing. Right? I think that's a great point. I think that if a, a manufacturer can provide that level of value add, right, to their distributors, yeah. Um, that's going to give them a big, big advantage. So, I, just, I mean, the more value add that you can provide with that, I think that's a, a really great point. Well, and I think, right, manufacturers, and this is a whole new discussion we could go path, we could go down. But at the end of the day, manufacturers are always looking for how to get more mind share. Sure. And, 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 you know, time and energy from their distribution partners. So what better way than to just, you know, instead of sending spec sheets and doing lunch and learns, what if we were really helping them optimize and maximize their business uh, with tools outside of that are product related, right? We've learned this from our testing. Let me show you how you can use that in your business. Or by the way, we've built our model so that you can actually log into a secure area and do some of your own testing. Mm -hmm. right? Just the, the, and no, the it's just, but it's value add, right? I mean, who are you going to do business with? It's, yeah, no, it's, it get, we talk about value add to the end user, value right. add from the manufacturer is no different, right? Yep, and I, and I think that is becomes a trickle down effect. My, yeah. I think my point that I look at the strength of all of this is, and we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, right? About AI adoption and so forth. You don't have to be first, in fact, sometimes it's better to be a fast follower. But what you do need to be thinking about is whether you're a manufacturer or a distributor is what am I doing to stay even with or ahead of my competitive uh, set of, of, of factors? And am I on the right roadmap so that I do these things and get these things right long term? Because we talk every week about the changing customer and the changing buying habits and keeping up with that. So if a manufacturer can partner with a distributor, everybody doing more to serve the end user great and if obviously if you're a manufacturer that provides more value with a better product you're gonna you know take the lead over your competitors yep. as well yep. so i thought it was good it was a good article about that it's from a, yeah, no, good. yeah it's and it was, actually it's from a uh, a british publication um i think it was called the manufacturer.com and it, it uh spoke to and, and got a lot of information about uh from a division of siemens and siemens is a you know monster german company yep. Uh, and, um, but they talked about how they're doing it in small business units, which I thought was cool too. All right. E-commerce and marketing, We're jumping into our next segment and section here. Um, the, uh, first article talks about Granger doubling down on digital commerce. Do you have any thoughts that came out of that? I had questions just cause I don't fully understand the whole, I'm not an expert on Granger's, uh, digital strategy, but it sounds like from reading this and I'd like your take on it is they have kind of two different web presences. So they have one that's maybe yeah. Granger.com, which is a bit more full serve, more aligned with their sales team. And then they have another presence that's more, hey, do it yourself and um, you're more on your own. And it looks like they were really expanding the more do it yourself in, you know, scenario with it, which I found interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I guess for certain, I mean, I guess with their wide variety of, of SKUs, right? There's certainly a lot of SKUs that probably fit very well in that. And then there's other SKUs that fit more in products and product lines that fit more right. with the full serve approach. You're right. And so we can talk about that a little bit. I don't know if we have, like, sometimes we get some guests that are some wonderful former Granger executives that are with us. But, um, you know, Granger used this term. They were the first people I ever heard to use this term. Um, but it was, it's tied to, um, uh, as they call it, their endless assortment, right? And the reality of it is, you know, Granger has historically been as a company, as most wholesale distribution, is a hub and spoke model of branches with distribution centers feeding those branches. 
Well, all of a sudden, when e-commerce came around, they went to that endless assortment, which they went to with Granger.com is how they got started, which is traditional, right? We could plug in, you know, fastenall.com here, MSE.com here, any of the, the larger publicly traded organizations like that. They all kind of worked to jump in at varying levels of success and varying time frames. Um, and the idea behind that is a big part of what this, this article talks about, right, is when you have an organization... Uh, and I remember, you know, in my earlier days selling to Granger and going to Lake Forest regularly as a vendor, uh, being summoned, as I call it, for a for a, an overview of what they called their Granger Value Advantage program. And that was the message that their sellers were taking to the end users, which talked about the strength of their hub and spoke model. And they can get you anything quickly, but that's out of the branch and that's going on a delivery truck or UPS or somebody coming into a branch. Well, this e-com piece said now we can offer you so many more items that we don't have to have in the branch because if they're in our hub and spoke model, we can get it out of the out of the hub quickly, right? And uh, and this is I, I don't want to turn this into a discussion of the history of Granger because I'm probably not qualified to to talk about this other than my personal experience. But Granger bought, and we I think when we had uh, Ron Paulson on with us uh, in the Q4 of last year, we talked about this a little bit, Ron was very involved as a Granger, Granger executive in the early days of all of this. Early, very early in that, the, uh, was e-commerce was coming along, they bought a company called Lab Safety Supply in Janesville, Wisconsin. And Lab Safety Supply put out this monster catalog. And if, if you had a pulse and a period you could ship, ship things on time, Lab Safety would carry your products. And it wasn't about Lab Safety. It was general safety and it turned into industrial as well. Granger bought that and then... All of a sudden, they went from that model of Granger having three or four vendors per SKU, uh, or per category, I should say, Lab Safety having 20 or 30 per category. Granger up theirs and brought those down, and together they probably had eight or 10. What this article references about that they've had a little bit of struggle again, and it appears, and this is my take on this, but what I read between the lines was. Zorro, their online presence, is lower cost because they don't have that same branch structure that they mm -hmm. have to support from a margin standpoint. So it's pure e-com play. They went back to that lab safety model where we'll just kind of carry almost everything because the vendor will ship it or we might have it in our warehouse if it's a Granger SKU already. They've done a phenomenal job, but it kind of looks like they got a little bit ahead of their skis with how far uh, Zora went into that as well. Is that's kind of the crux of all of this. But the chart that we have, and we have it up on the screen here, and it's large in the article, you know, talks about them 2022, their total sales were at Granger were uh, 15 and a quarter billion, 2023, 16 and a half billion. But what they talk about too is their high touch sales versus their endless assortment. So high touch. Am I answering your question here? I guess is that the well, crux yeah, of that and then some. Yeah, that and then some. <laughs> I, I I think that the answer is is that the low touch is they're expanding. They're really trying to push that, right. and that makes sense, right? Is hey, you can get it here, right? You, regardless, you can get it here, or if you need more of a full serve or a, a higher touch thing, then you've got that as well. But I think this is saying they're doubling down more on the for the moment anyway yeah. on some of the low touch approach. Well, and you and you see that the success that they're having with that in this chart as well, you know, an increased uh, growth level that they're seeing with that. It's just I think they're also finding a balancing yeah. act of how to go do that correctly right yeah. now. Yeah. And they're seeing where those adjustments need to be. Yeah. But it's a great I mean, it's a great story and a great model to follow of how. No, they've but, I, but but I think that chart is really relevant. Right. Because we yes. talk a lot about providing that high level of service and providing that experience and all of that and getting that kind of balance and understanding. Right. I think there's some good some good data in there. Yeah, no, it's good. So again, uh, this is a good time for us to jump in since we're talking about charts, is um, again, Kevin Brown here, Tom Burton, we get together every week and have this discussion about the news of the week as it relates to wholesale distribution and manufacturing. And our focus is to try and take that news, peel the onion back a little bit, as we like to say, and talk about how that impacts wholesale distribution as a whole. If you're listening on the recorded podcast, what you're missing is 
some of the charts, some of the articles, the newsletter itself that we talk about here each week. So if you would like that newsletter and you do not get that, please let us know. Simple, two simple ways to do it is that you can uh, reach out to us at hello at leadsmarttech.com and we will get that out to you or you can join the podcast uh, website, which is www.aroundthehornpod.com. We'll get that information out to you. You can also hear previous episodes and so forth there. So yeah, that's it. Mike's comment here okay. real quick, and then I know we need to move on here quickly, but I think he brings up a good point, right? He says, with Granger doubling down on digital commerce means it'll be harder for smaller players to be seen online. Local distribution needs more than SEO to compete, right? Because, and he's right there, is, you know, the SEO model, I assume, fits very well with their mm -hmm. endless assortment model and their low-touch yeah. thing. And he says yeah. marketplaces will be taking away from relationship building opportunities. So smaller players and additional strategies for end user engagement. Yeah, there's definitely a poker game here that I think you have to think through depending upon who you are, who your market is, your size and all of that, that takes into that account. And how do you find your best, you know, niche, if you will, in that, um, in that, in that game, sort of that poker game, right? How do you get yourself the best position? I think there's some, you know, a lot of things to be thinking about there. Yep. So, I, it's, uh, Mike, thanks for that comment. Mike's been on the on the podcast here with us a number of times, a couple of times. Mike's the uh, founder of our co-founder, I think, of InSupply, and InSupply works with local uh, and independently owned wholesale distributors on helping them get their messages out. It's I N S U P P L I. Uh, Mike does a great job with with their team of of supporting local and independent businesses as well. So it's good stuff. I think we have a heckler too. I don't know. We might need to. I saw that. Her, uh, we might need you know, to we, ban her from further shows. I, I have clearly, I have no influence on her. So you may need to have a talk. Right. I think we just right. heckled on my wife. So as we as we talked about uh, the, I'm assuming she's relating that to the uh, the comment about uh, getting the newsletter. So yes, it was. All right, you have a talk. We have a talk with my wife. I'll take care of it. Yeah, I'll okay. handle it. But for those of you that don't know, because we didn't say it today, Tom and I have been lifelong friends. And uh, so he can sometimes uh, get a message across to my wife better than I can for me. So good. Uh, of course, Mike thinks it wasn't a plug. It was an acknowledgement of great work that you guys are doing at InSupply. So, all right. Next article as we jump ahead. Can digital content drive worthwhile ROI for distributors? This is my take on this article is kind of cool. This was written by Lindsay Young. Lindsay's uh, with Three Aspens Media. She does just a ton in wholesale distribution. Uh, fantastic human being, great writer. She's got a team that does some neat stuff. Um, and um, I actually sent her a message this morning thanking her for that because I think what she did is kind of boiled down a lot of things we talk about regularly and, and made this kind of as a as a little bit of a roadmap, but most importantly, I think really calling out the, the importance of investment in digital content for wholesale distribution. But you did a good job. Yeah. And I, I <clears throat> you know, I, I it would be interesting to unpack this. Maybe I should probably be back on the show. I think yeah, we have a schedule. Year. She's on with us yeah. either in May or June. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously you have all of your product content and your website content about your products and all of that. What she was talking about here is additional digital resources that really, and I think it ties into what we were just talking about, right? That properly positions you and establishes the right relationship that you're looking to make with your customers. And, you know, that can come in a lot of different ways. One of the things that we're seeing a lot that people are looking for is kind of a lot of the things we talk about in this show, like what is the state of the market? What is the state of the market that we're in? What is the state of, so as an end user, there's a lot of potential value or a distributor rather, there's a lot of potential value you can provide to your end user just about right. what's going on in the market in the world and things like that, because you have a broader, broader view of things. So I thought that it was an interesting way of looking at, okay, how do, what kind of content do I need above and beyond my product information and, you know, the things I have on my website about my products and so forth. Um, I, I think there's a lot to talk about here, way more than we have time for today, but well, an interesting. Let's, let's, hit, let's hit some of the highlights because here, because I think what Lindsay's really doing is she's referencing online content, but it actually ties pretty well to, to 
the whole e-commerce journey, I believe, as well, because one of the challenges and, and, you know, in the title of this article, right, talks about ROI for developing content, right? And I think people also struggle with where's my ROI on my website if they're just trying to look at how many transactions they had on the website. And the website goes so much further than online transactions, right? It can be people just building orders. You know, I, I'd love to see some statistics uh, if you look at related to wholesale distribution of the abandoned cart numbers are probably dramatically through the roof compared to a consumer experience because you could go build your orders online and see sure. once you're logged in and your discounts. And it's not uncommon. We know a big use of e-commerce within wholesale distribution is I'm just going to build my order online here, but I'm still going to have somebody go pick it up. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I still want you to deliver it. But uh, but it's, so it's hard sometimes to track ROI on a website. And it's the same thing with the, the, the you know, marketing content we talked about. But I want to hit some of these statistics. And she does a great job of the resources on this. She talks about 75 percent of B2B buyers prefer self-service experiences with no rep involved. How many times have we talked about that here, right? And that's Gartner's research. 71% of B2B buyers surveyed downloaded and consumed multiple assets to help with the decision-making process from demandgen.com, uh, right? 46% um, of B2B buyers surveyed report increasing the amount of content they consume over the past prior 12 months. Um, and so <laughs> this is the question, and I think this is the value of the article. And I, I love Lindsay, just a good, great writer. And she said, so the better question might be, based upon those stats, is what is the cost if you don't meet customers' increasing demand for digital resources? And that is everything from product specs, product videos, webinars, podcasts, if you have the desire to do those types of things, blog posts about how to do things better, and I love that, right? It's the, 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 the question is, what is the cost if you don't meet their increasing demand for digital resources? So I thought that was good. A couple of the last things she hits here while she talks about the value and the ability to grow wallet share with existing customers, I would suggest it's a defensive mode as well to keep existing customers. Then it would be to grow wallet share with those, improving customer experience she talked about. But the other thing that we don't talk about is and, and what we the article doesn't talk about, but we see regularly and then we discuss here is when you put great content together with great online resources for shopping, it allows that local or regional distributor to not only go to major new marketplaces because their sphere of influence grew outside of, you know, South Salt Lake, Utah out to now their scope of influences into South Florida and into even other countries. But it also talks about the opportunity to reach new vertical markets, right? There are vertical markets that if you're a regional seller, you might have 20 branches, but you're in a regional part of the country and you sell into these four verticals. When we get online with great content and great e-commerce presence, now we can start hitting new verticals outside of our geography. So good article. Yep. I appreciate it, Lindsay, putting that one together. Yeah. And I'm going to hit Bob's comment here real quick. Sure. Um, you know, you suggest they're preferring rep free experiences, but at the same time, buyer remorse is going up because of it. And, and I wrote about this actually quite a bit in my book, mm -hmm. even though that, you know, the stat like you read there, like especially younger buyers are saying, oh, I just yeah. want to do everything self-serve. It's not necessarily in their best interest to do everything self-serve. Great point. And to Bob's point, right? It's like, a lot of times you end up doing something you're like, oh, God, what did I do here? Did I buy the right thing? Right. The buyer's remorse. Yeah. But you also see a lot of situations where buyers just end up in a confusion of content. Right. You end up in content confusion. You end up with a down a rabbit hole and then you don't make any decision or you end up down. The you have paralysis. So, right. So and again, we can I don't want to get into a whole different discussion here, but I think really the answer is, is not entirely to figure out how to make a self-serve environment for somebody but how to create content and how to set things up so that people, when it's appropriate, are willing to engage with your sales team, even potentially earlier in the cycle. And a lot of that is in adding the value that's there on the things that are that are happening. So I think there's a, a give and take here. It's not just how do you make this as more and more self-serve, it's how do you then provide the right content that and the right thought leadership that may cause somebody to go, huh, you know, maybe I should have a conversation 
earlier in the buying process with this company and not just do everything on my own. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think what bringing this all full circle, I, I appreciate Bob's comments on that, um, is I think what we really want to do is we want to enable the customer. We want to keep them going down a journey or as your book talks about our yellow brick road, right? We need to guide them where they need to go, but we need to give them those those uh, breadcrumbs on the path, so to speak, mm-hmm. that fits what their desire is, but we want to keep them moving down mm-hmm. our path, right? So I mean, in sales, right? right? You're, either, right. You're, e- you're either in your buyer's process or your buyer is in your process, but we need to be able to give them more content, more tools, more ways to buy. And I think that's the beauty that, uh, that, that wholesale distribution in particular has over traditional you know, e-commerce is, hey, you can, you can consume data on the website. You can consume data in the e-commerce shopping experience. You can place an order from an e-com experience, but go pick it up at a branch or have it delivered, which is very, very different than, or just say, hey, you know what? I'm interested in this. I've got it in a shopping cart. I haven't clicked. Have my rep contact me, you know, and uh, and that's you know I'm gonna I am gonna we had a somebody said a uh, uh, a commercial break earlier and I will do that really quick because that's one of the things we do with with uh, at Lead Smart along with even our our partnership with Optimizely and their e-commerce platform is taking that data from a third source, bringing e-commerce data into the CRM platform to gain customer intelligence to watch that journey. Where are they consuming data? Oh, they've been to a branch. We see branch notes. They've got a shopping cart that's not been emptied or not been fully abandoned yet. Where, where is that life cycle of that customer? So it's good stuff. Tom, I know we got a lot to cover. Yeah. So, I, I, I want to, I'm going to hit Mike's real quick right. though. He says there's a, a, a um, easy for me to say a uh, program project. Yep. project coming out called gray data <laughs> targeted to get in users to see the content and driving to the experts. Very interested to see how that comes out because I, I do think that again the 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 right strategy isn't just how to make things more self service. The right strategy is to create a situation where people are willing to engage with your sales team when it's the appropriate thing and it's going to move things down that buyer journey faster. Right. So anyway, yeah. a lot to talk about there. I'm sure we'll talk more about it as we go along. Let's get into tech, cybersecurity, and AI. Yeah. So let me before we jump into that, there's a theme in this today. Um, on this particular segment of, of uh, the newsletter and, and our discussion. And, and it really, it's like I probably should have, as we put this together, ordered these a little bit better. Um, you know, the, the last article, and we'll talk about that as well, talks about AI isn't ubiquitous in the business world, at least not yet. And, and one of the things, and I'm going to kind of preface this, and this is one guy's thoughts, but you get to hear them when you come here on Fridays. Um, I think... And I, I'm out constantly at conferences, and, and what I hear regularly in the webinars that I listen to is, as we talk about AI, as we're talking, and we talk about this consistently here, right? All of these things that we're going to be able to do, and all of the things that uh, we're seeing coming down the pike, so to speak, is all really positive. But what I consistently hear is fewer use cases of what people are actually accomplishing. One oftentimes is because the AI models and tools aren't quite there yet, um, as, as your team you know, works with right now, as we know things we're gonna do, but we're not, the technology's not quite there yet to back it up. Um, but I just consistently hear this message. It says, just get started, just get started, just play with ChatGPT. And, and there's some truth to that, in my opinion, that that's good to understand where we're at today. But as we talk about it today, two, two things that I want to preface the discussion with on the next few articles. One is you don't have to be an expert at AI today. Maybe there's three things. One, you don't have to be an expert at AI today, but you need to be aware. And then you need to be working on a roadmap for your company. And that roadmap isn't just, we want to use AI and we want to do this, or we want to do some marketing or whatever. It is a strategic plan for AI that includes cybersecurity issues and it includes what tech stack looks like and it's so forth. And we could probably do a whole show on just the tech stack related to that. The third piece that I want to plug into that is a concept that we're going to start hearing more and more and more of. I call it the incumbent versus one-offs, right? Is there is 
every day I get multiple AI newsletters. You probably get two or three times the ones I do, Tom. But it's all the new AI tools that are coming up. And I, I think people need to have a roadmap and a plan versus just starting to buy one-off software, especially in the space that we speak to. My concept is, you know, the, I call it the incumbent. And Microsoft's co-pilot is the perfect example of the incumbent is the co-pilots in a trusted source. And I think people should be looking at, and we're going to talk about some successes and failures in these next couple articles about people that just kind of went out on a limb and trusted some things without a plan. So that's my soapbox for a moment before we dive in. Okay, good. Um, Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think what I've learned firsthand in working with customers is the crawl, walk, run process of preparing yep. to use AI is got way more steps and is way more detailed and is way more, there's, there's a lot more crawl that has to happen before you go even to the walk and to the run than I would have believed if you would have asked me even six or nine months ago. Right. So doing things in the right sequence, what I'm really learning is doing things in the right sequence, especially related to your data, but even how you use the data and how it's done is well, is, has such a such a huge downstream impact that if you get that wrong in the beginning, then you're kind of you know fighting, yeah. swimming backwards going forward. So so taking that, let's go back to this first article, right? The, the Air Canada chat yeah. chatbot ruling, and this was the situation where Air Canada somebody went in, I think, and asked about a bereavement rate. The chatbot gave back saying, "Oh yeah, you can do something," and it turns out it wasn't. Within the, yeah. the live agent said, "Oh no, you can't." They said, "Just buy your buy your ticket and then let us know later about the bereavement stuff, right. and we'll give you a right. discount." Right. Whoops. Right. Right. I mean, first of all, the biggest mistake is Air Canada just sort of honored what came on in the check chat right. right. So, right. I mean, what would that have cost them? A couple hundred bucks or a few hundred dollars? Right. It's like, and look at the amount of PR and other things that have been created from that. But that's a different issue. That's not what we're talking about here. What it really then, and, and this is where it is difficult, right, is to test the different, and I don't know that they made a bad decision or they had a bad company or they did, they had a bad roadmap. We don't know that, but they certainly, you have to go through this testing process with the data piece by piece and so forth and really then make sure that over time you're getting in the systems, learning more and more and more and taking these things into consideration. So. Yeah. Again, we don't know what happened there exactly. I, I think it's been a bigger PR issue than it is actually a technical issue on the things that are there. But I think the point being is that without doing things in the right sequence and without doing this things, then you potentially create a situation where you can, you know, have some maybe some serious damage on things. Yeah. And and well, I do think just yeah, just one last thing. I think too, if you just go back to the third article, because I think in the interest of time we can hit these together. Right, the generative AI isn't ubiquitous in the business world, at least not yet. I agree, and the reason it isn't is because of what I just said: is that businesses are still figuring out what is the foundation that has to go in place to then be able to take advantage of this, and at the same time, wait for the AI technology to get to that point where it's more industrial strength. I, I, the great recap, right? The the latter part of this particular article says both chatbots and humans make mistakes. Right. Mm -hmm. And and we're in a world right now where we're just I mean, think about how much what what has happened in the where where are we at with that? The. um, Not even barely 18 months. Right. Since Jet GPT was launched and what has gone on in the world. Right. In in that setting, it's just phenomenal. And um, and so we're we're not even in the. I, I, I'd say we're almost in the embryonic stage of AI uh, to even be thinking about the crawl, walk, run stage. So it's important, but I mean, I'm seeing some tools out there that, that we've had customers talk to us about that they've seen that I've gone and looked at. And it's like, I see what their website says they say they can do, but I know because of the stuff that you and your team have shared about what doesn't work yet in the AI world, and people are saying that they can do it, it's not going to be a good experience. Right? No, it works great in a demo, right? I can demo yeah. anything I want to there. But when it comes down to having an industrial strength production ready product in a business, that especially if it's based around their data and 
tying in other things. There's just a process that has to go through on that. That is, um, and, and the interesting thing that I'm learning is that process, and I'm, I'm really trying to work on documenting it, but I keep learning more things. And it's like every time I sit down to try and document the process, I learn something new. But everything along the way in that process is, is really understanding how everything builds on each other. And I, and I don't know how to explain it well until like we actually lay it out. But you get something here and then you can build on it there and you can build on it there. And there's there's insights and information that people aren't – I hadn't thought about. I mean, I'm finding things in data, insights and in data that I would have never even thought about a few months ago, right? Yep. That, again, if structured the right way and are put in the right way, then provides that foundation downstream. So, again, it's, I believe the roadmap isn't about what products am I buying. The, pro, the roadmap is about what is the process that I'm going through to create a foundation so as the products become available, whether they're from an incumbent or or even a new player, I have a foundation to be able to use those, test those, and validate those in my organization. So it's a little bit of a different, it's kind of a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down down approach. That's good. So before we go off of this, there is another article here about, and we won't go into the articles, but... It talks about a basically a, a, a technology guy accidentally finding uh, a hack in a major system uh, within um, uh, the Linux operating system. And I, I, I wrote myself a little bit of notes in my show notes today was about you know I see I can see a Tom Cruise movie coming out of uh, you know or a Mission Impossible thing with something like this. And the the, the bottom line is someone got into and bear with me if you're listening to, to this closely and like, ah, blah, 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 Linux, whatever. I don't, I don't deal with Linux, but stop with this for a minute. And I'm going to give the layman's term of this because we talked about this a little bit with uh, Lynn uh, Chase last week. So somebody's doing basically a drip attack from the outside into a major piece of software. Now, Joe Smith that runs XYZ distribution in Omaha and Kevin Brown here today that probably doesn't mean that much to us. But what happened was before this got caught, basically accidentally as the story talks about, is it's not just, okay, there was a hacks in Linux. That impact that it had is almost every other piece of, I should say almost every other, many other pieces of software that you either are using now or uh, could be looking at using are built using this Linux platform that now has these holes in it those holes, had they not been stopped, could have gotten to all of these other software products. Is that right about right? Um, so not, right. Not, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you're in the right direction. I don't know if this is 100% what you were saying, but what the, the point is here, right, Linux is an open source operating system. Obviously, companies that are using that generally have some pretty, you know, well-sophisticated IT people if they're using Linux because it is open source. You have to upgrade it. You, you need more technical knowledge than other sort of things that are there. I, I think that there's two points here, right? One is the fact that it happened, right? So somebody, you know, open source means that everybody, there's, it's open to anybody to contribute to the development effort. Some bad actor came in there, put in something that was a backdoor into it, um, into this open source software. I think on the other side of it is, again, a more sophisticated IT per person who was doing some performance testing was able to identify that and catch it before it became a bigger issue. Yep. Um, I, again, there's, there's two parts of this, this article. One is, yeah, beware if you're using open source, and there's a lot of open source conversation occurring with large language models and AI and so forth. So you need to be eyes wide open when you're using open source and make sure that you have people that understand that and can deal with that. Um, and then secondly, I think there are other tools that will be <clears throat> coming out more and more, and I get this where AI can really help to make sure that you're looking at what you're getting and what you're installing and so forth and what are the potential impacts and the potential um, ramifications of changes and so forth as they're coming in. But yeah, I mean, it's, it, I, you know, open source is becoming more and more of a common use case. You hear it a lot. And I think this was a good wake up call on that. Well, I think that the big takeaway for me with this is, you know, how it would could impact other software and other organizations was, it talked about it. It says this attempted attack, funny enough, they call it the supply chain attack, 
carefully and slowly pushed updates to a little known tool within Linux that then moved it to the back through a back door into millions of other computers at once. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue. The reason that I, I, I shared any of this together in these three key articles today was have a plan, know who you work with. And really it, it ties into what we were talking about in our supply chain section earlier today, which is, hey, if I've got a warehouse or, you know, 55 warehouses across the country um, and I need to understand my vendors better because of supply chain issues, I need to take that same approach to my technology vendors to understand things like, hey, tell me about your cloud security. Tell me about the platform that you're built on and what that means to my business. What are the risks of me using your cloud-based solution or AI, cloud-based AI solution versus someone else? And understanding that and getting that, that clarity mm -hmm. becomes extremely important. No different than you would check, does the, your supplier of safety glasses truly have an ANSI certificate yep. that makes them safe? You need to apply that diligence across to your technology vendor. So, whew, okay. Agreed. All right. Let's, head let's, let's move ahead here. Yeah, those sections make my brain hurt because that's your day-to-day -day talk, but I have to think through that stuff. So do um, you want to quickly hit this article about uh, in our sales and M&A section about uh, salespeople being coachable? Any thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, I thought it was a great article. It's one of actually one of the better articles, more one of my favorite articles in a while, actually, talking about... It surprises you know, me. That's awesome. Um, well, but I we work with salespeople all the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. And... and you know, you hear a lot of conversation about that not wanting to change. I don't want to do things differently. I want to do things the way I've always done them. This is what we've already, you know, that's a, a large part of what we deal with that day in and day out. Right. And what this said is that sales managers who coach consistently re recognize a 28% of revenue from their coachable salespeople, the right. operative word being their coachable salespeople. And what they went into is, is, you know, what kind of makes a, what are the attributes of a coachable salesperson? What does that mean? What should you be looking for? I think now more than ever, especially as you're all the, for all the reasons we've talked about even today and whatever, mm -hmm. having, when you hire salespeople and you have, you know, outside salespeople or even inside salespeople, having the hiring people that have a mindset that they want to be coachable, I think is a huge deal right now because there's just no way that the legacy approach is going to exist and be productive, whether it's the year or two years or three years down the road. If you can't change that, it's you're going to be in trouble. Uh, great points. Uh, you know, and you've got you know, thousands of people that log into Lead Smart Channel Cloud and and most of them are on. Well, almost all of them are customer facing and many of them on the sales side of things. So it's important to see that I might kind of thing that I liked is, you know, coaching and training are different. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, training being more in a group setting, coaching being a one on one. And there are people out there that do well in one and don't do well in the other and vice versa. So good, good takeaways on this. So, again, um, our, this is part of our uh, weekly newsletter around the horn and wholesale distribution and manufacturing that goes out. If you'd like to get that, if you don't just reach out to us, we'll get that to you right away. Um, yeah. And I'll hit Bob's comment here. I, I agree. Gonna, I think a lot of companies. It. A lot of companies, they talk about this, they almost never implement it. And I agree with you, the difference between coaching and training. But again, you have to have somebody who's willing to make that change, willing to shift, look at mm -hmm. things very differently along the way, um, which I think is going to be a, a, an imperative attribute, I think, for anybody in the in the sales, marketing, or, or operations part of, of, the, of the business. Yeah, good. Thanks for that comment today, Bob. We appreciate that. So good stuff there. Uh, as we wind down today, people in leadership, uh, a nice piece here that uh, we added in. The reason we have a people in leadership section is because our friend Dirk Beveridge reminded us that we didn't and we don't talk about people in leadership enough. Uh, Dirk, if you don't know him, is the uh, the man behind Unleash WD and the We Supply America tour that's getting ready to kick off again. He's uh, been with us on the show and the what we call ended up being called the Legends session that we had in January. We've got to get this one again scheduled for the middle of the year to review our prognostications. Um, but Dirk has uh, got a session that's starting and uh, it's called Force for Good. And it talks about the six million employees in distribution and supply chain 
uh, that are on the warehouse floor, the plant floor, all the way up to the C-suite and uh, talking about helping people thrive and making uh, folks in the workforce feel prosperous and, and good about what they do. And, and I tell you what, you want to you want to spend some time with somebody that just makes people feel good. It's dirt. So uh, he's a master at that. He, he is. And uh, and he's a hugger as well. So <laughs> that's good stuff. The last uh, piece in that uh, segment is about a potential shortage of manufacturing workers, and it's threatening the U.S.'s global competitiveness. Uh, we've talked about some things like this quite a few times before on the on the broadcast here. And you know what? When we talk about the geopolitical threats in Asia, in the Middle East, and so forth, the supply chain issues that we've talked about, pushing things to onshoring, this this would impact us mostly with onshoring. Then we've got you know the Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips Act and all of those things. Manufacturing plants are going to be being built. It's going to help construction, uh, but we've got to put people behind those jobs. And we are not at a place where AI is going to solve that problem yet. No, no, unfortunately, that's not an AI. That's not an AI solution. No. Nope. So, hey, that kind of hits it for the week. We've also got each week a section in here called the industry scuttlebutt. We've talked a little bit about some uh, M and A stuff in there. Uh, White Cap acquiring and doing another acquisition. One of the first comments we had for today was uh, from our friend Paul Kennedy, with the president and CEO of uh, Dakota Supply Group. They just broke ground on another facility. They're widening their reach, uh, so good for them. And a couple other pieces in there as well. So um, that's about it for this week. I'm a friend. Yeah, well, don't forget about the good reads that your Google oh, Doc right. are probably safe from uh, AI training. So yeah, that, um, that one you're, you're I, I was, you know, that certainly made me sleep better. <laughs> well, my YouTube well, videos are not, but my Google Docs are anyway. So. Well, but it's it's you know it's interesting. I'm glad you caught that. I, I was going to move on. You're, you're it's funny. I'm moving us on, and you're the one who wants to to, to stop on oh, time. That's no rush, no rush. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the that's funny. <laughs> Trading hats there for a moment. I needed a laugh. Thank you. Um, so that article, your Google Docs are probably safe from AI training. This is kind of a big deal, though, right? Because that is a big concern for people in general right now is, you know, what from me is being used for training, right? If you just use the, you know, chat GPT and just start typing stuff in there without knowing and understanding how you're using chat GPT, you're training those models. Um, same thing, whether it's um, Gemini slash Bard, whatever it might be. The, there is a caution here, right? If, if I send you a Google sheet, which I do constantly, that's safe, right? So let me rephrase it. So they're saying, um, yeah. is uh, so they're saying, if I send you a link to it and I click in that Google Doc or Google Sheet that anyone with the link can use it, they're saying that's safe. But, you know, I, you we're both and probably particularly me, very active LinkedIn users. And uh, every day I see people put links to it. It typically comes from the M&A venture capital and investment world, but people are putting worksheets and links to Google Docs and surveys and things like that, right? And probably a good, and I probably saw two or three Google links to Google surveys last week, and those are being used. And they, they clarify that if you're putting those out in a domain like that, you, you're, you're at risk. So I think what it, it says is we all need to kind of be paying attention to what do we put out there and yeah. and recognize that, you know it ties to you know interestingly enough too a whole nother realm of discussion but you know we we have some customers that uh, use lead smart channel cloud internally but they'll use for their marketing automation they use hubspot um and um google's talking about buying hubspot and what happens to all of your customer data if it's now in hubspot and it's part of google's domain so that's the big push that, that people are another topic for another day. Don't, well, that's don't, you know we're about, don't you don't you know we're about out of time? In fact, we're over time. <laughs> Man, what are you doing? All right. Uh, good comments today. Thank you. Thanks everybody for all the good comments and results. Um, and uh, yeah, now are we not here next week? We are. You know, it's undecided. Uh, you're in Florida. I'll be in DC. I think we're going to do something. Okay. But, so stand by. 
Watch okay. where you get our info from. Um, let's do this, Tom, and tell me if this is technically safe. We're either going to do a best of recording will be available or we're going to one of three things or we'll pre-record something or we'll do a short show live. OK, or we'll do nothing. I, guess. I don't think no. I don't think we'll do nothing. Okay. All right. So one of those. We'll three. All right. Because the, fo- okay. the, fo- so, the following week you're off in Vegas or something, right? I am. I am I'm doing I a college I reunion and I don't. I don't think I'm going to be very valuable during my college reunion on that Friday. So you assume we'll, you have, we'll figure something out tomorrow or for next week. Joke, there's a joke in there about your current value. So that's true. Uh, no, you in Vegas, that's your, that's your play place with your buddies. And I don't want to bother you while you're there. Uh, but Hey, a couple things, we've got uh, some great guests coming up over the next couple months. CEO of national association of wholesalers, Lindsay that wrote that great article earlier, Jonathan Fain, fine from, Distribution Strategy Group, uh, some other great minds in AI like Jonathan. So stay with us. Uh, again, Kevin Brown, Tom Burton, co-founders of Lead Smart Technologies, and uh, the, obviously the founders of Around the Horn and Wholesale Distribution. We thank you for being with us. Our request of you is if you like what we do, tell your friends. And the easiest way to do that is if you're even if you don't listen to us on on uh, the podcast or on a YouTube. Jump over to those places, grab the podcast, leave a review, click the subscribe button, LinkedIn, follow the Lead Smart Technologies page, the Lead Smart Technologies page on Facebook or on YouTube, and give us the thumbs up, make some comments, and or just forward the newsletter to your friends uh, and help get that word out. Our audience is growing each week, both globally and here in North America, and uh, we're thankful for you being with us, uh, some of you faithful listeners and some of the new ones that we get every week as well. So. That's it. Tom. Right. Have a good we'll weekend. Talk. Yeah. Everybody do the same. Be kind, do good things, and be safe. Take care. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and our guests. Each week, we try our best to dig into the topics that are impacting your business. So please reach out to us and let us know how you think we can make the show better or topics you'd like for us to tackle or talk about more often and even guests you'd like to see join us. We're looking forward to bringing you next week's session and hope that until then, you stay safe, stay focused, and do great things. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast and leave a review to help others in wholesale distribution get access to the conversation. And finally, please check out our sponsor, Lead Smart Technologies, and their manufacturing and wholesale distribution industry CRM, customer intelligence, and channel collaboration platform. That's Lead Smart Technologies at leadsmarttech.com. <laughs>